you can see there's a storm coming and that means one thing it means we have to change this to this you see that tarp and the reason why I bothered to put a tarp here and over there on top of all the dahlia pots is because it's been raining non-stop for the past days almost a whole week if I would say so dahlias don't like that much rain especially if they haven't really come out of the soil it's a tuber that tends to rot if it's too wet especially if it doesn't have the leaves to kind of like you know transpire that excess of water or moisture so what I decided to do to protect my dahlias just because it's been raining a lot and it's not just like a mild rain it's like pouring rain um, it was just to give them a little break with those tarps that way the water won't fall on the pots it will fall on the sides and they get a little bit of a chance to dry up because it is warm enough but this soil has been so wet I already lost a couple of the plants so I don't want to lose all of them many of them haven't really come out yet because I just transplanted the tubers 30 days ago and some of them surely take their time so for the most part all I do is latch the tarp some of the pots that were outside of the margin of the tarp I just placed on top the good thing is right now they're so small it wouldn't really affect them I just have to make sure they're really in there so they won't fall off and damage them and that's basically all I did I really like these little hooks that they sell in the big box store because the, it makes it easy to put on or remove my tarps so when I need them it's gonna be um, raining a lot I still keep it bent because it's not right on top of them and even though it won't be for that long but it's so hot I just don't want to risk it so high enough where the plants may get some rain but not like pouring rain on top of them and I use these tarps a lot in the winter when we're gonna get a lot of snow let's say we're getting four to six feet I put my tarps on top of my frost blanket that is on top of a layer of straw and that helps my plants such as peonies not to have so much snow that when it's melting it's like drenched in water as it melts and then they well just rot I figured the first season that's probably what happened I wasn't putting the tarps because of the straw and blah I wasn't thinking about the snow as it melts and then it freezes again and then it melts and freezes so it keeps the plants under there very wet for a long time even as it's melting some of the roses had like a puddle for months and I just couldn't do anything about it because it was too cold so it would freeze and then melt and freeze and melt and freeze and so those roots were drenched in water and plants like roses and others especially peonies lavender um, most of the plants I would say they don't like to be drenched in water unless they're actually water plants but see I have the rest of my dahlias here most of which have come out I did lose a couple I'm very saddened about it but well it's unfortunately part of the whole show and then so I have my tarp I just have to remove it whenever the Sun comes out because these plants do need quite a bit of Sun and you might notice that shade cloth that's for the sweet peas and other spring flowers because our spring is so short basically it skips from winter to mild winter to summer so things like sweet peas the peonies at certain time of the year they like cooler temperatures and the way for me to extend their life is to use the shade cloth to put in, in I place those plants on that side because they get shade on the top from a tree and that way I can have spring flowers all season which is a tip for you if you live in a very cold climate where it skips to summer and it's really really warm that's something that has worked for me and also if you live in a very very warm zone and you don't get much of spring for the same reason shade cloth would make so much of a difference that you might want to try it just to trial it out and see if that works for you so I have other plants there as well the mint and other herbs are loving it there because they get sun and they get the heat but it's not the burning sun that we have up here remember we're in zone 5a and I'm at almost 7,000 feet above sea level so the sun is more intense in here and thus many of my plants even if they are 
some loving plants. They tend to burn. So with these guys, I don't worry that much. I have some Cosmos that I started in there. I have some Strawflower Snapdragons that I just started to see if they make it. I don't know. I was just experimenting. And I have a fever few and a Dusty Miller that overwintered right there. I don't know if you can see right there in the background. Right, right there. And then I have my hibiscus right here where I get sun from the morning, which is quite intense. And the heat. And there's a butterfly pea growing right there. So that overwintered. I thought it died, but it just came back when I took the plant out. And I was like, yeah, okay, free. Well, not free because I did plant the seed last year, but I thought it died. So apparently it just went dormant. So that's what's going on in here. And so that's all I do. So basically, oh yeah, I forgot something very, very important that I need to do because we just planted some carrots and some beets. And since it seems that this is going to be one of those storms where it's pouring, we need to protect the carrots because the water, as it comes down pouring, it can mess up the seeds. So we have carrots on this planter, in this part, and we have beets here. We're going to put potatoes over there, but it's too late for potatoes. So we have to figure out something quick. Maybe we'll add some beets as well. We do have some carrots that overwintered. And you can see all the happy plants in this area. I really need to pinch the sweet beets. But it gets so cool in this area that I have here that I get to have sweet peas all the way to the first frost, which is between the end of September and the beginning of October. So having sweet peas all season, fantastic. So what I need to do is get these totes this is where I had my dahlias overwintering in plastic bags with vermiculite. Remember that it's different for everyone. So you might want to try out um, peat moss or vermiculite on different tubers just to see what works for your climate. We get very dry in here in Colorado where I am at. That if I put my dahlia tubers in peat moss, they get moldy. So it's humid enough for them to get moldy, but dry enough that I can't leave them in just whatever. Um, wood shavings. Some people use wood shavings as well for the dahlia tubers to overwinter, but it doesn't work for me. They get moldy. So what I figure out that works for me is vermiculite. So what I do is I put a couple of tubers in a, in a plastic bag. And then I put vermiculite, and then I put them in these totes. And it's easier for me to check tote by tote uh, during the winter. So you could also put vermiculite and then the tubers in the tote and then close the tote partially so they don't rot out. But for me, they dry because of the weather here. So I'd rather just do a few tubers at a time per bag, vermiculite, but anyways. So this is what I'm doing right now to protect the carrots in case the rain gets too intense so that the seeds don't get displaced because they're so tiny. And so you can see there's a couple of carrots growing in this planter that overwintered, but most of them didn't make it, so that's what's going on. And here I'm very excited because you can see that most of the dahlias have come up. If not, they're starting to come up. And these guys have to be pinched as well if you want a lot of blooms because that way they get the signal of start branching out. The, the plant gets bushier and that way you get lots of blooms. Otherwise you would just get a very thick stem that is basically hollow and you'll get flowers but not as many as you would have gotten if you had pinched the flower early on. I know it feels weird the first season I was like oh I don't want to pinch them. I pinched some of them and not the others and I did see the difference. And I regretted not pinching them all the same. So from then on, I always pinch them. And you can do it with your hand carefully. You just grab like a stem here, you can see. I pinch the stem that was growing here in between and then they'll just give the signal to branch out again. Usually you remove the center um, stem and then it'll, it'll develop two more. So not a bad deal. 
same with the zinnias. I sowed the six. Three died before I transplanted them. So I placed these guys and once they recovered, I pinched them again and hopefully they'll get bushy enough that I won't even notice that it's half of the amount. Another thing I have growing in here is corn. This is the purple Cooley. So Cooley Morado corn it's called. And I'm very excited about corn because this is the first time I grow it. It seems to be doing well. Even though one of them got kind of like damaged with the water that fell from the other tarp that I have in front of me. But it seems that it just recovered because it's growing something in there. It also means that it's the perfect opportunity to add some Epsom salts to our peppers that might need it. Especially the ones that look lighter in color. Just so that they get a little boost. Are you coming down with me? Are you gonna come down with me to see the tomatoes? Yes? It started getting cloudy, so I'm gonna try to hurry up because that just means that either it's gonna start pouring rain or lightning. Because I did hear thunder and with all the, you know, the camera and all that stuff, the last thing I wanna be doing is being out here during a lightning and thunderstorm. So what we did here just a couple of days ago was to crawl these uh, comfrey. It was getting so big to the point that we couldn't even get in. And because all the pollinators that we have here love this plant, it was really hard to get in there without getting sting. Usually bumblebees won't sting you if you don't bug them, but we didn't want to risk it because they just love these flowers, both bees, bumblebees, all the local uh, bees as well. They just love this plant. And point being, we didn't want to disrupt their feeding and then we didn't want to get stung too. So we had to cut a lot of it and it doesn't go to waste because we use it as fertilizer. At least I use it. It's very, very stinky fertilizer, but then you water it down and you should be okay. And so a big chunk of it was removed. We corralled it like this, nothing fancy, just simple bamboo and um, cotton cord. And because also it was covering the crops that we have here. We don't have a lot of stuff, but we have chives that have been overwintering for the last three seasons. We brought this plant from California and it's still just fine. It comes up every year. Last year we thought it died because we couldn't see it, but it was because of the comfrey. It was covering it and it just stayed dormant. So it just came up this year and even divided. And then we also have some chamomile that if you see, it has moved this way and then up because it was covered by the comfrey. So it was trying to reach out for the sun. We also have some uh, green onions in here. And I think that's a volunteer uh, yarrow. I'm not quite sure, but it looks pretty much like yarrow growing in there. Our neighbor had some, so probably flew or with the birds. Because we also have a lot of birds here, so they tend to help volunteer plants around. This is an echinacea. This one we bought in a nursery and we just transplanted it. And here you can see our eggplants. The darker one is the Ichiban. Then we have the Rosa de Bianca, which is my favorite. And then we have our tomatoes and our garlic, which are doing great. We also have some borage that it's growing. So if you see this plant around, it's mostly borage. And I have both the white and the blue one. So it seems the white one takes a little bit longer to bloom, but yeah, just something to keep in mind. So this plant here is a volunteer episode. We did buy this from the nursery last year and I guess it seeded out and the rains and snow probably washed these seeds over here because it was further in. And so we're letting it grow because we didn't really buy any or started any from seeds. So we figured, ah, fantastic. We don't have to worry about it and we get episode. So we have more borage growing. And something really cool that's been happening is if you check this out, we're having garlic scapes. We still don't know what to do with them, but I'm excited because we love garlic. Anything garlic is like very welcome then fine by me. <laughs> so here we go, more tomatoes, which these are some of the bigger priorities. 
Um, we have the Golden Queen USDA and we have Sanadu Green Goddess. And they're doing really well. And some of them are even showing signs of starting to create little bulbs. They're showing signs of growing little flower buds. So. And then here we have the alum, which is doing very nice. What I really like about this plant, aside of it looking really cute, is that it attracts a lot of smaller pollinators as well. Maybe you can't see because this camera does not focus on macro, but it gets so many pollinators like small native bees and that for us is happiness because it's attracting insects that help control pests. So down here, we have some lemon balm that we got at the store, some German thyme that we also got at the store, and look at those little purple flowers, they're so cute. We also have some winter savory that came out from last year. And then look at this. All of these are cucumbers. We have cucumbers growing. We have like one, two, three, four, five varieties. And then we have melon. I don't know which variety these are because obviously I can't see the tag. James probably knows, so I'm probably going to put it in the caption. And then we have nasturtiums. I think this is a uh, Empress of India. And then this other variety, I don't know which one it is, probably a mix. The reason why we have nasturtiums here is because apparently they help deter the cucumber beetle. So because we do have the pest, even though it wasn't very abundant last year at all, but maybe it just didn't have the time to breed because we had winter a month uh, before. Um, this year we're experimenting by putting the nasturtiums here because of the cucumbers because we've had the bug before on the squash and in the dahlias. So I'm also starting some in a tray so that I can plant with the dahlias to avoid having issues with the cucumber beetles. This is a Japanese mustard. We tend to remove the little um, flowers because they attract a lot of aphids. Literally gets infested. And because right now we don't want any aphids on our tomatoes, we tend to just remove the flower buds. And this is a volunteer that we, well, just got here. I don't know, it could have been from last year or even their first season because we did plant some mustard around here. So we have more tomatoes growing. They're doing great. Some of them are a little spotty. I'm gonna show you a better example of a spotty one. This one here, it's a purple-ish tomato. It's called um, amethyst cream. It's a small cherry tomato and it's been attacked by, I would say they're the radish mites. They're little black mites that usually like to be in the radish and the beets. Um, this year we don't have either or in the terrace, so I don't know where they came from, but they're attacking our um, tomatoes. It won't last that long because usually we use beneficial nematodes and the rainy season is perfect for them to wander around and eat all the bugs and larvae. And so that's our solution and it always works. So we just got them on the mail yesterday. So I guess they're coming in sometime this weekend. So probably tomorrow. And then we have some volunteer cilantro, which we can't complain because we eat a lot of cilantro. I think we planted cilantro the first season meaning our first full, full season and it seeded out and it grew last year and we let it grow like big and crazy and it just went all over the place so right now we have different plants of cilantro growing in, in different areas of the terrace which for us is perfect because that way we don't have to be buying at the store anymore and then we can also let some of it bolt as you can see this one is looking a little different because it's starting to get to that point and that way we don't have to seed it again next year. It just overwinters here nicely. And if you want to have cilantro all season, I would suggest a shade cloth. This year we're going to use it for the lettuces because last year they vaulted early on. So it's an experiment this year. And we also have a little bit of barash growing in there. And the rhubarb, which because it's been a little cooler because of the clouds and the storms and so on, it has recovered nicely. With these guys, because they're so thick, you have to make sure that they're watered because they're in five gallon containers. And the leaves sometimes 
prevent the rain from falling in there. So you have to make sure you hand water them just to, to make sure that they're watered. So here we have more garlic and more tomatoes and a few weeds. So we have to stay on top of that, but we also have dandelion. And the reason why we leave the dandelion is because we mix it with our salads. Apparently it's very good for your flora, but don't take my word for it. There's a bunch of websites that might tell you better what it's good for. And some people even, it is my understanding that they use the flowers for tea. Here, as soon as they bloom, we remove the flowers. Either we eat them or leave them for the bees, but then we remove them so that they don't bloom. And then it's more work to be removing excess dandelions. We leave a few, but not a lot because to be honest, we'd rather keep that energy on things like the tomatoes and basil is coming soon. So we want that energy to go to the right plants. But dandelion is edible. So if you have some and it's not really affecting your garden, you may want to add it to your salad. By the way, it's a little bitter. So just be aware of that. Here we have some shallots and more eggplants. These are a variety called astrachum. And as you can see, it's already forming some fruit. So I'm very excited to try this new variety. And here in the lower terrace, aside of having a few weeds, including delicious dandelions growing, we have some volunteer yarrow growing in here from our neighbor. And then we have this gooseberry that we need to bring down. And we're gonna experiment by trying to um, do cuttings and grow them from cuttings just to see if that's doable and we have more comfrey because this was the brightest idea we could have for growing plants in here so what happened is the first full season we were here we had beans and although we had a little bit of a failure because our puppies uh, broke into this area and smashed everything um, we also noticed that we had bowls and so snakes and bulls don't get along and we noticed that we had a garden snake that loved hiding where the comfrey was so we decided to move some of the comfrey down here um, in the falls for it to overwinter and it worked because the season after we planted the same we put beans snap peas sugar peas and we had no vol issues whatsoever and james says that he did see the garden snake down here I figured it's a great place for the snake to hide. Plus it keeps it cool because it can get really hot with intense sun in here. And so that it tears the bowl, unless the snake actually ate the bowls. Then, well, that was our solution. And I know some of you might be like, oh, that's so cruel. Well, it is nature because the bowls in a way are a pest and they eat your crops. And I'm fine with nature in its right place. This garden is not meant for them to be in here. Plus they can carry disease and we do have dogs and cats. So in a way, there's a reason why they're snakes. You know, it's, it's the natural predator. And so even my neighbor said, I'm offering a little reward for whoever catches a garden snake and brings it over because her bowl issue is getting really intense. So for us, this worked. And I think because this comfrey is getting too big, we're gonna dig it out in the fall before the ground freezes and we're gonna give it to our neighbor so she can encourage the garden, garden snakes to come over and that way her bowl issue goes away. So if you have that issue, you might try something bushy like that where the snakes can hide. Comfrey is a great thing for us because it overwinters, we don't have to worry about it. It fixates nitrogen in the ground and it's also technically free compost for me because I use it for all the flowers. And even though it stinks, it works great and I don't have to be spending that extra money on fertilizer. We just focus on spending that money on the fertilizer for tomatoes and veggies, but not on the flowers. So I'm happy with that. And that's with the comfort. Plus the flowers are gorgeous. Look at this. They're so beautiful. And then we have our pole beans growing in here. This is the first teepee. And as you can see, they're growing quite well. They're already latching on and getting taller and taller. They're climbing their way. We also have um, the carmesine fava beans here. They're doing really well, 
they're doing really well. They recovered after those squirrel attacks, but they did it. And we have more pole beans in here. They're also doing great and climbing up. We just fertilized yesterday, so it was like perfect for the rain that's coming because they started to look a little yellowish. And just to make sure they're not getting deficiency on anything, we just decided to fertilize. And then with the water, it'll just go into the right place. We have more fava beans here. I always forget um, the name of this one, but I have the tag here. It's called Urcopina. It's like a fingerprint um, pattern. And it's doing really well. Look at this guy. It's already that big. Probably all the way to a little bit higher than my knees. So I'm 5'4", just as a reference. And then we have another comfrey plant. This is the one we're gonna leave here for the snake. And then we have these, the greasy, what is it? Gray eye greasy beans. It's supposed to be a rare bean. I think I've mentioned this before in the videos. And so we plan to save quite a few of these beans because unfortunately that um, the store owner passed away. And so I don't know who else is selling this priority. And so we need to keep these going because apparently they taste really good. We have our patch of sunchokes here. The ones that were starting to grow in the fridge are this ones, the shorter ones. And then those are the ones that overwintered. So they're basically not that different in height. So they're really catching on quite nicely. And in case you don't know, uh, they're also called Jerusalem artichokes and you basically eat the root. It's like a little tuber that you can cook. We eat it like potatoes. We make uh, like an au gratin version of it for Thanksgiving. So it's perfect. And we eat it throughout the whole winter. These are the tomatillos. Uh, we have the Queen of Malinalco, which is a smaller one. I don't really know what's going on with that plant because it's not supposed to be like a ground cherry. But I guess we'll see because we did transplant kind of late. And this is a volunteer tomatillo, which I'm definitely getting seeds off because in zone 5A, I do want tomatillos that can overwinter and grow by themselves. Now here we have the shelling peas. They're getting big. I don't know how tall they get because last year we had them behind the snappies and they didn't get as much sun. They still produced quite nicely. And we did have a bowl that later maliciously disappeared, I guess. Thank you, snake. Um, but point being, they're getting a little bit taller than they were last year. And sorry for the crow, I can't do anything about that. And then these are our sugar peas for this year. I think it's an easy PC and there should be another variety that I don't know the name about. We didn't put tags this year because there was just two varieties. Or maybe we do have tags, let me see. No, I think just one, and it's the easy PC. But in any case, and then the back, we have our snow peas, which are, are one of our favorites. And they're starting to get tall enough that we can push and sandwich them between a cucumber netting or trellis netting that we have and our fence. So I'm excited about those because we really like them. The only thing with these guys, because it's been raining so much, is that they're prone to uh, powdery mildew. Most peas are, even the sweet peas are susceptible to powdery mildew. So far I haven't had much issues because right now my sweet peas are under a tree. So they get rain but not drenched and it gets warm enough that it evaporates. My problem was at the beginning of the season before transplanting because I had them inside so they would get the mold. But these guys, by the end of the season around September, they get powdery mildew. And there's a variety we planted last year, which is um, Magnolia. It's a purple variety, and it's more susceptible than um, our easy pieces and normal um, sugar snappies. So that's why this year we decided not to grow it, even though we liked it a lot. This is still our favorite snappy anyways. This year, we just tried to avoid the chances of our plants getting um, um, powdery mildew. So, but if you can't do anything about it, Serenade works well. We've used it before with much success. And so that's something we can use. Actually, we're gonna, I think, add the Serenade 
early on before the fall just to prevent the powdery mildew but yeah so they're getting there and i think that's it for this little tour so thank you for following along and now it started raining i think it's better for me to get indoors watching this video I hope you liked it and don't forget to subscribe to follow along on our crops the harvesting if you have any questions please leave them on Instagram um, we'll be more than happy to answer them or even on our Facebook page um, tell us what you'd like to see in our content tell us uh, what plants you'd like to see more of from the ones we have grown and yeah go ahead Please ask any questions. Um, if you'd like to learn how to grow in containers, we have a bunch of videos. But you can also ask and we'll be more than happy to respond and help you out in whichever form we can. And well, remember that if you're growing with us, we can all grow together. to change all of this well this is where I have because it means only one thing because all the dahlias because we have all our dahlias in these uh, five gallon pots and right over there and it's been raining non-stop no. never mind Come on, boy! Come on, Reddington! Come on, Red! It means we have to change this. And you might notice that... Sh uh, um, and you might know... Ugh. This plant here, it's a volunteer... Um, oh, what's the name? Epazote. And then here we have some, um, and here we have some chal, bleh, not chalots. Well, in Spanish it's chalotes. Urki, urku, that we can push them and sandwich, that we can push them and sandwich, bleh. So this year we just tried to reduce the amount of susceptibility. This year we just tried to reduce the amount of susceptibility. Ah. <laughs>